Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for staying. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here. I am not part of the scientific community at all. I don't work with animals in my day job, but I want to. And why I'm here is to kind of tell you a little bit about who I am and why I'm, what I'm doing. So what does it mean to be an industrial designer? For the last 10 years, I have been helping companies develop products and services. So that means that I'm studying how people interact with things around them, and I'm redesigning them so that they have better experiences. All of you today are interacting with different products, the seats you're sitting in, the pens you're holding, your phones, and there's been someone behind there thinking, how will you go about interacting with this thing? So, um, there's many ways to go about it. I use a methodology that's called human-centered design or design thinking. And I'll go into that a little bit further in the next slides. But my current idea is that animals are users as well. They're users of a lot of products and they're users of a lot of surveys. And if we can overlap this methodology in some way, we can for sure elicit behavior change because I can make you sit differently if your seat is different and you won't even know it. <laughs> uh, not in a bad way, I can make you more comfortable or less comfortable. And I think that that way we can change welfare. So what is human-centered design? It has three basic stages. You start from your user. So the first stage is expansive. And a lot of you here do a lot of these things. You go, you have interviews, you observe. But you can also have um, this co-creative observation. So for example, I've been looking at someone that's installing a motor, standing there and having them teach me how to install it because based on that, I can then come up with solutions. And then after that, that means um, to do so actually, and something that's really important is before I go out to the field at any point in time, I become a three-year-old. And why is that? Because I have no bias, I withhold judgment, and I ask why a lot. <laughs> because that way I'll let the person teach me. And then I come back and I have all this data. So I go into this um, process that's like expanding and contracting. And we use a lot of post-its and there's a reason behind that because you synthesize behaviors and you start seeing things that make sense and you find patterns. And the objective of this is to get to an insight. And an insight is an actionable statement that you can then take action towards. This is followed by prototyping and iterating. So if I have an idea and I think it'll work for a leaflet, I'll go out, check it, see what users think. Maybe the colors weren't working. Maybe the message wasn't working. I'll come back in. Maybe I'll try something different. But it's very quick. So it's not getting it perfect. It's just getting it to a point where I can get a reaction so I can perfect it as I move forward. And then finally, I bring successful products to the market. And when I'm saying I, I mean all designers, not just me. Uh, and it is because there's a user need behind it. And the product or service I have designed for you is something that you need, so you will most likely use. So the first stage, this co-creative observation, there's many tools and techniques. And I wanted to kind of run you through a few of them. but. The first one is really what I was telling you about. Like I, I, I ask to see how the person behaves in their own context, how they make their own decisions, and what affects that. Because I'm not designing for myself unless I want to buy everything I design. <laughs> so I'm designing for other people. And um, based on that, I can, it's like a semi-structured information. And then I start giving it a little bit more of structure, and I can do journey maps. I can have my user do diaries or self-document, and I start understanding why things are happening and why certain behaviors are occurring. And then there's also a last set of methodology, and within these, there's like 10 to 20 exercises you can do with people. Um, and the last one is iterative conversations. So this is about a, kind of getting to that deep need, because we all know that what people say is very different than what they end up doing. But if you allow them to explain themselves, you will get to that deep need that they're trying to figure out. So what if we use these same tenants and these same ideas for animal design? And 
It's a theory I have of trying to have empathy-driven observations because we are not animals. That's my time. Uh, we don't experience the world like them. We don't see the world like them. Yet we design for them as if we do. So what if we turn animals into the users? And a, what if we make solutions that are really about them and not us and thus elicit that behavior change in us because we're designing for them? And this is really quickly, um, I've been kind of doing a little study prototype, but uh, I kind of slowly trained a calf to be okay with a GoPro on its head. And I've been trying to see what, what is their experience of the world and see how that would inform how grazing grasses are uh, planted and other things. And so this is just a try at going at it, it's a prototype. But really what I think is that if we understand human needs and if we stand, understand animal needs and that interaction, we can start defining what actual well-being is. And there's a very easy way that's using products and services that's just out there and ready to get started. Thank you.